Up to this point, all the encryption algorithms we've looked at use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. Those are called symmetric key cryptographic systems because the encryption and decryption are mirror images of each other using the same key. There's some significant disadvantages to that. The big one is that you somehow have to get that secret key to someone else who might be on the other side of the world. To get around that problem, you can use public key cryptography. Public key cryptography uses asymmetric key pairs. And what that means is the sender and the receiver have different cryptographic keys. Now you can't use any old key. You have to use specially constructed keys. In particular, there's a public key, which is not secret. In other words, part of the key you can tell to everyone, including the adversaries. So that's a public key. It's not secret at all. You can post it on the web, attach it to your email, anything you want. But there's also a private key. And the private key is a secret key known only to the key owner and not even to the message recipient. Now, how in the world can you get someone to talk to someone else if neither one knows the other secret key? Well, you can do it if the public key and the private key have a special mathematical relationship. So if Bob wants to talk to Alice and they exchange public keys, it works as long as the public keys and each of Bob's and Alice's private keys have a special relationship. At a high level, the simple version is you could have a public key based on the product of two prime numbers. So Bob picks two prime numbers and they're both secret. He multiplies them together and he gives the product as his public key. It turns out that factoring really large prime numbers is computationally infeasible. So he can put that public key out there and no one else will have the computational power to figure out what his secret prime factors are. Alice would do the same thing with different secret keys and they'd exchange public keys. Since nobody can factor these public keys, they're out there in public. Maybe the message is hello Alice in the picture and Bob encrypts it using Bob's secret key and Alice's public key. So Bob has a prime factor that only he knows and he uses that as well as Alice's public key, which is a product of two prime factors only she knows. The encrypted message is sent over a public visible channel. Alice then uses Bob's public key, which is a product of two prime numbers, and her own private key, which is a factor of her public key, to de decrypt the message. The nice thing about this is that once the message has been encrypted, only Bob could have sent it and only Alice can read it. Even if you're an attacker and you know Alice's public key, you can't decrypt it because to decrypt it, you need her private key, which you can't get because you don't have enough computational power to factor these huge primes. Now there's a catch here. This is computationally expensive and it requires huge key sizes. Typically you'll see in the old days 1024 bit keys, but now it's more likely 2048 bit keys or maybe even 3072 bit keys for a long lived embedded system. Not every key works because the only valid public keys at these huge sizes have to be products of two primes. So the key space is relatively sparse. A lot of values aren't valid keys. And in order to break this, you don't need to try all possible to do the 3072 bit keys to break it. You only need to find a prime factor that divides it and the primes are about half the number of bits. So you only have to attack about 1500 bits to be able to factor a 3072 bit key. That's still a lot of computation, but because of the structure of these public keys, something like 256 bits just won't get the job done. Again, the cool part of this algorithm is that you can get two people who've never met and have never exchanged keys to be able to communicate with each other as long as they know the other person's public key.